Mm-hmm. Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 127, Games by Indigenous Designers. I'm Sean, and with me, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record these shows live every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop, and it would be awesome if you could join us. All right, tonight we've got a question from one of our awesome Patreon patrons who recently saw the Coyote and Crow Kickstarter and wondered if there were any other tabletop games designed by Indigenous or Native designers. Before diving into that, we announce a new giveaway, and later in the show I'll be talking all about Legendary Metal Coins Season 6, which is currently live on Kickstarter. Finally, I've got some really early thoughts on World's Fair 1893, the new edition, and the Quacks of Quedlinburg. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. Just two comments that we thought were worth highlighting tonight. Uh... All right, so first up. We have a comment from Jeff Seuss. Well, yeah, technically I, I cheated here. It's two comments from Jeff Seuss, but they're on the same topic. And uh, Jeff is one of our awesome Bellhop Patreon patrons. And he wrote in about your discussion two weeks ago about superhero RPGs that Sean's been checking out. So Jeff wrote, I love the overview of different approaches the community has taken to supers. I think you should try City in Peril out. I think bonds would grow on you. Then later commented again to say, have you checked out any of these? Godbound from Sim Nomine Publishing, a supers treatment based on Scarlet Heroes, but by the guy behind Stars Without Number, famous for his excellent GM story creation tools. Godlike or Wild Talents from Arc Dream uses the one role engine games about supers during World War II and post World War II respectively. Mutant City Blues from Pelgrane Press. This is a gumshoe mystery game that asks, what if the X-Files were investigated by super mutant cops who could have been the X-Men? I know at least the first part of this ended up evolving into an ongoing conversation about Bonds on our Patreon Discord server, and it's probably worth talking a bit about here. So thanks for all the comments, Jeff. All right, well, thanks, Jeff. Uh, yeah, City in Peril and Bonds. This went in. This went into a very long and in-depth conversation. Uh, Jeff had been listening to the podcast uh, later and and was sort of playing along live in the <laughs> uh, chat. And he was doing some research and 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 asking me some questions. And I was pulling up my, my book and flipping through pages and answering some questions. Um, I think the main outcome of it, though, was the book doesn't necessarily do the bond system justice. Uh, and realistically, I, I should try and get it to the table and, and push some people to try and ignore their early hesitations and try it out there. So, uh, and yes, uh, world's in peril, not city in peril. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it may work in practice, but suffers from the way it's laid out and mm. described in the book. Uh, now, Godbound, uh, I found, he mentioned, I, they have a free version of it on Drive Through RPG. So I checked it out this morning, and it is interesting, but it's a little bit too fantasy-oriented for my particular tastes. Uh, if you wanted to play supers in a and d like setting, though, this could be the game for you. Yeah. Uh, God, uh, sorry, uh, Godlike or Wild Talents. Uh, these are a, Godlike is the original, and Wild Talents is the super post-World War II version. Um and it's based around this one role engine concept, which in itself was really sort of odd to read about. It's, it's the whole concept is you roll once and that determines whether or not you hit, where you hit, what damage you do, all from one hmm. particular role. Um, and I wouldn't mind reading up much, uh, reading up about that, but uh, the power design system in it in, in particular uh, sounded really interesting. They've got a, a, a really creative way of, of designing heroes' powers. So I'm going to take a look at that one eventually. I couldn't find a PDF of it to uh, scan through. So I may uh, maybe spring in for that book. Uh, Mutant City Blues. I've looked at this one in the past, and I think for an investigative take on supers, it's great. Personally, it's not a direction I'm interested in. But for folks who like that, I think Robin's Gumshoe system is a fantastic tool mm-hmm. for that sort of thing. Sounds good. Now, as usual, we'll comment. toss. Uh, oh, sorry. 
As usual, <laughs> we'll toss links to all of these in the show notes if anyone else wants to check them out on their own time. Now, our next comment is about your review from that same episode. Frederick mm-hmm. Rourke had this to say about our White Star Galaxy edition. Full Metal Plate Mail is a good white box OSR with clean and smooth rules. And later commented, you guys should try playing White Hack. Well, thanks for the comments, Frederick. Um, I do have a copy of Swords and Wizardry White Box, uh, not in print, in PDF. Um, one that at the Tenkers Tavern was having uh, weekly chats that before we started doing this show on Wednesday, Sean and I used to attend now and then, and I ended up winning a copy of it. So I do have a copy of White Box. Um, you can actually get White Box for free with no art. You can get like the no art version for free, which is something I wish more indie publishers did because... It's a great way to get the rules and the mechanics out to people's hands and then see if they like it to pay that additional amount to get, you know, the full color version or the uh, the art filled cover. And if I remember correctly, like even the full version is only like five bucks. So for free, you can check out the rules for five bucks and check out the whole thing. So I do own that and uh, I've looked through it, but I haven't read it all. Um, I do know that it'd be basically the same mechanics as White Star. So I kind of get it. Um, this is the first time I've heard of full metal plate mail, though. I've never heard of that one. Um, I'll probably take a quick look at that at some point. Now, White Hack, I have to assume, is based on the Black Hack. Now, the Black Hack stormed the Ennies a few years back. Everyone was talking about it. Um, there's uh, some particular iconography that's well known for it because the designer is very much a uh, screw the man kind of mentality and has a certain aesthetic to his games uh, to, to show that attitude. I guess I'll word it that way as politely as I can. Um, so I've definitely heard of that, and I know everyone started to hack this. Like, the Black Hack is basically the Powered by the Apocalypse in the OSR world. Once the Black Hack came out, everyone did a version of it. Like, there's Mecha Hack and Beast Hack, the Anime Hack, the Cthulhu Hack, and more. Actually, one of the ones I saw today when I was double-checking the different types of hacks, and there's like 200, was the Four Color Hack, which I was thinking something Sean might want to check out. Honestly, though, I'm not really in the market for a fantasy retro clone. I think I mentioned this during the review. I did not grow up on OD&D or BX or the Rules Compendium. I grew up on AD&D 2nd Edition. And I like my games with skills, and I like proficiencies, and I like some of the more modern trappings that were added to that system. And I definitely preferred Thacko to having to look something up on a chart. So, that's to me, for one, it's not really my thing. Plus, I'm kind of burnt out on fantasy in general, like, um, like I liked White Star, but what I liked about White Star was the fact I could do any type of sci-fi story. For these, I don't know, it's just another way to play D&D with simpler or harder rules, it's, but you're still playing D&D. And I just don't have, if I want to do that, I'd probably play 5th edition at this point. Yeah, and I have to say, uh, Four Color Hack is en route. <laughs> um, I'll talk more about it once I've had a better look at it. Though it's amusing, the PDF at least, that comes with the... Uh, the, the paperback I bought is in black and white, which is interesting for a four-color hack. <laughs> yeah, that is interesting. But it's a hack of the black hack, so yeah. I guess they're going with that that part of it. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Now, the one exciting thing we want to cover before we get into the main topic... All right, as announced last week, our Terraforming Mars digital giveaway went live on Tuesday, yesterday. Right now, many of us are stuck at home and have no way to play our games with our friends. To help mm-hmm. alleviate that pain, we thought it'd be cool to give away a digital copy of one of our favorite games of all time, Terraforming Mars. Now, similar to our previous giveaways, this will run for three weeks. Uh, you can enter right now through a widget over on the blog, tabletopbellhop.com. To enter, you will need to follow me on Twitter. Trust me, you'll, you'll enjoy it. I, all I post is gaming stuff there. And sometimes I retweet some food stuff, but it's pretty much all gaming stuff. And you can also earn bonus entries for the usual things, right? Checking out our Instagram page, subscribing to our newsletter, etc. As a special thank you to those of us who have joined here live, be sure to stick around for the full show, as we'll be dropping a code at some point during the show that will get you two bonus entries in this contest. Yeah, we're being evil and trying to make people stick around just by giving them bonus entries, bribing you to stay if that's what it takes. All right, in addition to this, we I've already sent out our hotel guest Patreon patrons, that's our $5 higher level, a code for five bonus entries. And I will say, if anyone joins our Patreon before this contest ends, I'll happily provide you the code as well. Well, what are you waiting for? Head over to the blog and enter now. Good luck. We're here to answer your game gaming or game night questions. 
Tonight, we've got a topic, topic from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Brian. What games, board, and RPG are produced by Native Americans First Nation creators? I'm particularly interested in game experiences from the Native American First Nations perspective versus the typical view through the lens of colonialism. First off, thank you very much, Brian, for the awesome question. This is a good one. Um, but before we get to the list of games I was able to find, I do have a few things I want to say first. So first off, during this segment, I will be using the term native and indigenous fairly interchangeably. Now, Brian himself is a Native American. Neither Sean or I are in any part whatsoever. Um, I have heard that indigenous peoples is currently the most accepted term to use, but that many people still also recognize and use the term native. I am well aware that some other terms have been used over the years and don't plan to go that route. Just please realize that we do mean all respect to these creators and the games they have made. Similarly, as language and understandings change, what we say here today, we mm -hmm. understand, may not remain appropriate. We happily invite comment and discussion on these topics and our use of the language to help and promote others without voices. All right, next, I have to express my disappointment. Um, this is based on how hard it was to find the games I did find for our list tonight, for our topic tonight. Now, when Brian first asked this question a couple weeks ago on our Discord channel, I fully expected to find a significant number of games designed by Indigenous people. Like, not a ton, but, like, enough that... I, I'd be able to get like a top 10, right? There'd be enough to pick from that I, I could find the best indigenous games. And like, I knew of a couple off the top of my head, like at least two that, that I know about well. And I went digging, expecting to find more. And I'm sorry to say, I was only able to find about a dozen games in total. Like in all board gaming and role playing. And to even to get to 12, I had to include some very, very old games to get to that number. Now, what I did find is a rather large number of games about Indigenous people. Uh, it's a very popular topic, especially with the Old West, many of which seem to handle First Nations culture well and appropriately. So there are enough games out there about Natives that seem to be handled well, but most of them are designed by German and Italian game designers. And almost none of them appeared to hire any indigenous consultants. Now, I will admit it is hard to find that information right now. It's not consultants aren't always listed. It'd be nice if they were. But as far as I could tell, um, the vast majority of uh, like even award winning games didn't seem to have any consultation involved. Now, for example, I found the names Michael Kiesling and Wolfgang Kramer on a number of award winning modern and abstract games with indigenous themes. Now, these are designers I enjoy their non-indigenous themed games quite a bit um and the ones i have played that are indigenous themes are, are solid as well like these are award-winning spiel de jar like golden geek nominated games and it seems like this pair enjoy that theme right I, I don't know what historical research they did and they also do seem to handle it um responsibly so they have games ranging from the aztecs to the native american pueblo tribes of the zuni and the hopi but nowhere could I find any indication that Michael Kiesney or Worthley and Kramer ever worked with any actual indigenous peoples. Now, I'm not necessarily saying they didn't. I just couldn't find evidence of that. Now, what I did find is a very large number of games that didn't handle native history or native issues well at all. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. We're going to keep this on the positive. Yeah, sadly, poor handling of such topics has been prevalent for so many cultures and peoples and it's something we hope in our small way to help through giving a voice to these mm -hmm. games. Now, due to how few games I did find, I decided I had to expand on Brian's original question. So I, I broadened the scope of my research to include games by any indigenous designer instead of limiting it specifically to the Americas. Now, overall, I just hope the situation improves and that the recent success of a couple of modern games on our list tonight will open the doors for a new wave of indigenous, native, First Nation designers and games. Finally, I do want to apologize in advance for any mispronunciations of the game names. Sadly, Board Game Geek does not have a pronunciation guide and finding one online uh, for any of these game names led me to different results. I would go to various pronunciation guides and they would all say completely different things. So uh, just please know that I tried. Well, now on to the list of games we were able to find. We've broken this list down into four sections. First off, we have some historic games, older games that are still played today. 
This mm -hmm. is followed by modern hobby games, which we divided into a group of board games and a group of RPGs. Finally, we've got some honorable mentions. Other than these groupings, the games are in no particular order. Mm -hmm. Now, another thing to note is that due to coloni colonialization, many of the rules for these historical games come to us by way of German or English game historians, mm -hmm. often taken from records brought back from overseas by explorers or other colonial institutions <laughs> uh, with imperfect understanding and not from the records of the people themselves in many cases, unfortunately. Yes. Now, let's start with some much older games, including one very popular game that I don't think many people realize have native has native origins. All right, that's not our first game on our list. The first game I have on our list is a game called Patuli. Or Patuli. This is a two-player board game that was created by Aztecs. Patuli means kidney bean. And when originally discovered by Spanish conquistadors, the players of Patuli were using the beans like dice. They would throw the beans to figure out, and depending on which side of the bean was up, it would mean something. The players roll their beans, and based on what they rolled, they will place tokens on the board or move existing tokens, with the goal being to get your tokens from your side of the board to the opposite side of the board. Now, on the board, uh, which is actually like a big cross, there are some spots that are safe, but others that are not. And if your opponent lands on your beam when it's on one of the unsafe spots, they eat the beam. Now, this is recognized as one of the oldest board games ever discovered in America. Some people claiming it's the first board game discovered in America. Now, this was discovered in, eight, in 1350, but that's just, again, like Sean mentioned, when the colonialist found the game and reported in its existence back home. It's probably existed for many years beyond that. Now, uh, recently, as, uh, as recently as 2011, an archaeological dig discovered what they believe is a Patoli board inscribed on the building nice. that they were uh, excavating. And they placed the date for that between 600 and 900 A.D. No, oh, excellent. So yeah, I, I just, like I said, that was my theory. And I think that's going to be the case for all of these games. Um, I'm going with dates that were listed on Board Game Geek, but like, again, those are going to be the dates that they were recorded in history, probably not the dates that the games came from. Now, a big part of Patoli was gambling. This was a gambling game. And most games were played for some form of treasure. And remember, we're going back to the Aztec time period here. So some of that treasure meant other people. There was actually a time when the invading Spanish priests banned the game due to the fact that people were selling themselves and their families into slavery over a game of Patoli. Yeah, interestingly, one of the main draws of the game was that if you managed to roll an edge on one of your beans, you won, period. <laughs> game over, regardless of your opponent's position in the game. And that was Patoli. All right. Up next, I've got Dudo, or Yo Dudo, or I Doubt. This one also has South American um, roots, with the earliest mention of the game supposedly coming up in 1800. This is a game that I'm pretty sure everyone listening knows about, and you could go to Walmart right now and pick up a copy. Or if you've got D6s at home, you can just go download the rules. This is the one I had no clue had indigenous origins. Dudo is nowadays known as Liar's Dice. I had no clue that's where this game come from, came from. That was the big surprise of doing my research today. And one of my copies of Liar's Dice is actually right behind me. You can see it in camera. Well, and that was Dudo. Next one I had not heard of, and that is Zon Ah. Now, where our last two games were dice, or, well, bean-based gambling, this next game is not. This is actually a family game. It's actually documented that this game was mostly played by the women and girls of the Kiowa Indians of North, Af North America, sorry, where this game started before spreading to other tribes. Uh, there are reports of this game being played by the Navajo, the Kiris, and the Zuni, with each having their own names for the game. But you know what? I'll toss the names in the blog post version of this. I don't even want to try to pronounce these. I apologize. <laughs> now, Zana is a horse racing game where the player's horses, represented by sticks, race around a circular board made of 40 stones. Players would take three sticks and throw them at the, a striking stone that was in the center of the board. And depending on where they landed after bouncing off the striking stone, that would be how far their, their horses move. So this is Creek Wood, literally translated from Zon Al. 
often confused and mistaken with other Native American games, though. And that was an interesting thing in the in the research I was doing on this game is that historians have have really struggled with a lot of these Native American games because they were similar in many ways and right. would get clumped together often. All right, up next is Puluk, which is an abstract strategy war game for two players. This originated with the Ketchy Indians of Guatemala. Uh, as the game spread, it did start to be known by other uh, names like Bull or Bool or Bulik. Um, most popular nowadays seems to be Bool. Like if you Google Bool board, you should be able to find copies that you can buy nowadays of Pulik. A note uh, I discovered, some authors... Uh, speculate that the game may actually be Mayan in origin as the Ketchi themselves are descendants of the Mayan peoples. So you're going, yet another instance of first documented time, but the game probably existed for a long time before that. So this game is based on a board with 21 spaces all in a row, like basically, basically a bunch of lines, and it'd be you're on the line or you're between the line. The players each have five warrior pieces, and the goal is to capture the opponent's warriors. Now, there are five official variations of this game and in modern play whenever you play like in a tournament or something the goal is to play all five of these one after each other with the overall winner of your game being whoever got the best three out of five now these game types in english are the ant the eagle the scorpion warrior ant and fire now the originally this game was playing with corn grains and corn stalks to make up the board and the game has come a long way since then um, put it this way, this is one of the more modern ones because there's an app for this. You can find any number of different copies of Pulik on the App Store. Well, and that was Pulik, uh, and I should just note again, as Mo was saying, there really appeared to be a lot of different house rulings on this one out there from uh, historical and modern. All right, next up we have Kalois Awalonene better known here as Fighting Spirits. Serpents, sorry, Fighting Serpents. Uh, this one comes from the Zuni Indians of New Mexico, who took the game Alquerque, which is a version of Checkers, possibly the actual version of Checkers, that the Spaniard invaders were playing and decided to make their own version. Good on them. To play this game, all you need is a board, stones, or pottery pieces. Um, sorry, all you need is a board. Stones and pottery pieces were often used as playing pieces. Um, all you needed is to have two different colors. Now, being based on something like checkers, this is of course similar to drafts, where you're trying to capture all of your opponent's pieces. Capturing is done by jumping over an opponent's piece, and captures are mandatory. Now the board though is quite different from checkers, consisting of three rows of spaces connected by diagonal lines, as well as having a terminus point on each end that's connected to the other rows by curves. Uh, this is another one that you can still find people playing today. It's the kind of thing you go to a woodworking show. People may have a board there. You will see fighting serpents fairly common even today. And uh, this is one where the pronunciation guides had so many different options. So I'm going to say it was Kolawis Awitladnene, or fighting serpents. I think we'll just stick to fighting serpents. <laughs> Sticking with difficult to pronounce names for us white boys, uh, I next have... Tununu Vupi. This is the final game on my list. This is a two-player abstract game that's also similar to Checkers or Drafts. Actually, this one looks like someone took a checkerboard and turned it 45 degrees. It's all played on diagonals. Uh, this was first played and created by the Hopi Native Americans of Arizona. Now, similar to the last game on the list, all you need is a board and some form playing pieces, 20 per player, in two different colors. Again, usually bits of stone, bead, or pottery. Now, traditional boards were always carved on flat rocks. So, for some reason, they, they tended to do this in rocks, though there was one evidence where someone found it carved into a beam in a house, which I still don't understand how they could have been playing, or if they were just like, they were a fan of the game, so they put some art above their, on, on their hearth, I don't know. Um... Again, this is basically um, a, a checker style game where you're going to try to capture all the opponent's pieces, though there's a huge debate online for fans of this game whether jumping is mandatory or not. And the reason for that is this has a rule, and the problem is I couldn't find a board to show this rule in, in play, and I, probably if I had had more time I could have dug deeper, but it has to do with the fact where if any row or column is completely empty, you can no longer use a co that column anymore. So the board continues to shrink as you capture more and more pieces, which sounded really fascinating. Um, and then the theme of this is you are going to war, but you're taking each other's territory. Um, 
and what it was was the blank spaces rec- represented you settled. There were now people in those homes, so they're no longer fighting. And I thought that sounded really interesting. But like I said, I had a lot of difficulty. Like if I image search it, there's all kinds of different boards and trying to find exactly how that you can't use this part of the board anymore mechanic worked. And I didn't have much luck. Interesting. Well, that was Tunana Whoopi or something like, like that. that. I apologize again. Yeah, that our, one was rough. Uh, um, um, like I said, Tununu Whoopi was the, the, the one I saw, it, but it was pr- yeah. said quicker, like Tununu Whoopi. Well, that was the last of our historical games from various indigenous peoples and tribes. Now let's move on to some modern hobby games, starting off with a few RPGs. All right. The first one I have to call out is Coyote and Crow. Um, This is a role-playing game that is currently live on Kickstarter that has raised over $1 million and is actually the inspiration for this entire topic. Uh, It was Brian's discovery of Coyote and Crow and him pointing it out to us on the Discord that got him to start wondering, hey, what other games are made by, by uh, Native Americans? Now, Coyote and Crow is a science fantasy role-playing game set in an uncolonized future. Instead of extrapolating what happens from now into the future and coming up with Star Wars or whatever, I'd say Star Wars was a long time ago, coming up with Star Trek, uh, Coyote and Crow looks at the sci-fi future where the colonization of America never happened. And what you end up with instead is a world of spirituality and science. And this world was created and led by a team of Native Americans representing more than a dozen indigenous tribes. Everything about this game looks fantastic. The world, the design work, the artwork, even the price is reasonable. You're looking at $50 for the hardcover and PDF together. This is one game on the list. Like if you're going to sit here tonight and listen to this and go, Oh, I got to check something out. I want to check out at least one indigenous game. I want to do my due diligence. I recommend checking out Coyote and Crow. That's the one that I think is, is the most interesting. And in and in right now the biggest voice, which is important. All right. Well, and that is Coyote and Crow up now on Kickstarter. Next I have Erdragor. This is a game created by a black American Indian game designer who promises a game that reflects native experiences and how native storytelling is completely different from standard Western narratives. Now, one important part of this is the concept of Indian time. Had I had more time, I probably would have dove into that, but it's a rather fascinating topic that you can search up on your own. Now, similar to Coyote and Crow, one of the big things here removed from the background is the whole idea of colonizers. There was, this is a non-colonial world where nine tribes must survive against horrible things that walk the land. Yes, this game has a strong horror element to it. Now, there's a world of cultures, myths, legends, magic is everywhere. People can rend reality to their will or break it and unleash more terrible things. And you're playing through this city that's set on the Mississippi called Twain. It just, it looks really cool. Now, mechanically, it's based on the popular Fate Core system. So Sean and I are most familiar probably with Ironetta Accelerated. But note, this is Fate Core, not Fate Accelerated. So this would probably be a little thicker. And I got to say, it's a nice, thick looking rule book. And that was Edrigor or Edrigor. All right, next up, I've got to thank Twitter for pointing me toward the games of Mercedes Acosta, who is an indigenous trans femme from the Taino Nation. They are a kid literature creator, a kid literature illustrator, a graphic illustrator, and editor that you can find on Itch.io. Now, two of their RPGs are currently available. One is Los Arables, a mini horror RPG about being lost in the woods that it's played in a single session lasting an hour or less. It's very reasonably priced, but more interesting is a game called what happened. This is a missing persons horror tabletop role play about spiritual danger, cosmic encroachment and inevitability. And those were the RPG games of Mercedes Acosta. Unfortunately, that was all we were able to find in regard to tabletop RPGs from indigenous creators. We're going to move on now to board games. All right, up first, I've got Potlatch, a card game about economics. This is a strategic educational card game based on indigenous philosophies that was developed as a community work, sorry, as a community effort with local elders and language experts in the Salish tribes of the Pacific Northwest. 
This game is presented in both English and the local La Chute, La, sorry, La Chute Seed languages. Potlatch features a cooperative game mechanic that are based on sharing resources to meet the needs of others in the form of food, materials, knowledge, and technology. Now, the victory condition of this game, all players win if all of the players have all their needs satisfied by the end of the game. And I gotta say, that right there is such a different victory condition than a thousand games in my collection. Yeah, it's interesting. And, I, and some of the... Um information i know about those particular tribes in that particular area resource gathering was a major part of their life uh right. in in a, in a way that ne wasn't necessarily uh the same in other regions where resources were more uh you know, around where there were more resources to have uh mm -hmm. it was a resource rare area and so that so balancing uh diet and things and, and time spent Right. Uh, collecting diet was a major thing. So it's, it's interesting that from that region comes a game of this nature. Yeah. Uh, and that was Potlatch. Yeah, it's fascinating because it's all about sharing. It's all about passing your stuff to the right people so that everyone's fulfilled. Next, I have Nunami. This is recently kickstarted um, just in 2020. It's from a native Canadian, Tamasi Magniok. This is a hex-based abstract strategy game in which the players work with nature to improve their influence with respect to the others. So players must score points while maintaining a balance between man and nature. Uh, this is a really unique twist on abstract strategy and area control. It has to do with putting out hex boards and then playing triangle, triangle, triangular shape, triangle. Hex, I guess when you put triangles on a hexagon, they become triangle. I don't know. You put triangle cards onto these hexes and then when the hexes are full, you score them. But it's all about balance where you can't go too far. to. Uh, there's a purple and a blue color and you can't go too far to either side. It just looks really interesting way to do it. And at this point, this is the highest rated game on the list tonight based on Board Game Geek, though I do have to admit it doesn't have a lot of ratings, so I don't know if that's skewed one way or another. Uh, to be honest, like I said, Coyote and Crow is the one you should all check out, but if you're looking for a board game specifically, this is the one I'm most interested to try myself. Like, Coyote and Crow looks fascinating, it looks brilliant, I want to support it, but I'm not playing a role-playing game anytime soon, and I have a huge pile to get through. This looks like something I want to get on my table this weekend. All right, and that was Nunami. Next, I have Orang Rimba, the Forest Keeper. Uh, sadly, this is the last modern board game for our list. Uh, this was published in 2017 by Angrinini Pawati, a native Indonesian. In this game, players play members of the Orang Rimba tribe, which are natives of Bukidua, Bellas Natural Park, and Jambi. Uh, this is a tribe that normally and for centuries lived harmoniously with nature, having just enough provided for themselves to thrive without ever overstretching themselves. That was until illegal loggers arrive in the scene. Now the goal here is to fulfill your family goals, to collect everything your family needs, despite external influences. So this reminds me of spirit island is always always hyped as a great non-colonialism game well here's a game that takes the colonialism on the face it's like it's a big part of the game but it's from the present or from the perspective of the the indigenous peoples in this case this one unfortunately has one rating on board game geek and that's it and i'm not sure where you would even be able to find a copy of it but the concept sounded fascinating and again from a, a an indigenous designer from that tribe so i thought that was also fascinating you're going to get that tribe's perspective and that was orang rimba the forest keeper well that's it for our short list of board games from indigenous designers we do have a handful of honorable mentions as well we'll, we'll mm -hmm. point out why these games didn't end up on the main list as we get to each one all right my first honorable mention is the board game inuit the snow folk this was just published in 2019 to quite a bit of acclaim. Now, the reason this game didn't make the main list is it's not directly designed by anyone native. That said, the designers here did actually hire three Inuit consultants, which they worked on through the whole development of this, of this game. So not designed, but at least had the consultation there. 
Now, the other aspect that I thought was rather pleasing about this particular game was that these new designers actually took an older game called Natives, published in 2017, which at the time was considered to be culturally insensitive in many ways. They took this culturally insensitive game, hired the consultants, worked with the consultants to produce a game that was much more culturally considerate. And I have to applaud them just for that. So I'm giving it an honorable mention because it wasn't actually designed by a native, but at least they took the proper steps to get the consulting and to make sure the game was appropriate. Well, this is a new... Uh... I've never had Zoom drop you down to a thumbnail before. Oh, what the heck? Oh, uh, well, I'm back. Yep, yep, you're back now. Uh, that's terrible with this stupid, this is a good topic. And I, that I, was Inuit, the Snow Folk. Next item on my list is a resource instead of a specific game, which is why I didn't put it on the main list because it wasn't a specific game. And this is a website, nativeteachingaids.com, native teaching aids, all one word. This features a number of educational games created by natives for natives. Uh, their shop includes a large number of regional history games on various different tribes, as well as light games translated into different native languages. Now these light games, uh, I think might push the limits of copyright a bit because they do seem like they're just variations on Uno and Go Fish and playing cards. But it is cool to see them translating popular mass market style games to different languages. Now, in addition to this, a big part of that website is to bring back original languages and to keep them going. And the games that are really neat in this series, there are a series of conversation games and phrase builder games, as well as flashcards for teaching native languages. Now, I gotta say, these probably aren't much interest to hobby board gamers, which I realize is most of our audience, but I think it's awesome to see tribes using gaming as a way to pass on their heritage. And that was the games of nativeteachingaids.com. Finally, I have a game from indigenous designer Elizabeth Lepensi, who is Anishinaabe with family from Bay Mills, Métis, and Irish. She worked on a number of games as both a designer, consultant, and artist. Now, most of her work is digital. She did a bunch of video games and apps, but she did produce one board game called The Gift of Food. Now, The Gift of Food is a board game about Northwestern native foods that was published by the Northwest Indian College as a way for Pacific Northwest native communities to pass on cultural teachings about where to gather food and medicines to the fact that it has a map of the area and it would have hints like go past the mountains in this and you'd have to memorize these routes and be able to, to explain how you would get the food and medicine you need. Now, the reason this game did not make the list is this is not something you can go out and get. You can't just go buy this game. This game is being directly distributed to the Pacific Northwest Native communities by the Northwest Indian College. Now, this game sounds fascinating. Uh, like, of all the games I've read, this is one that sounds really neat. The, the production quality is really well done. And just the theme of it sounds cool. Like, like learning landmarks and learning how to find different types of food and making sure when you come back from a journey, you have a balance of the food and medicines your family needs. That sounds excellent. I, I think it'd be great if this was more widely distributed. It seems like the kind of game and the kind of theme that may be interesting for more than just people in the Pacific Northwest Native communities. And that was The Gift of Food. Well, that's it for our introductory list of games by Indigenous designers. We're going to head over to the lobby and see if anyone in our chat room has questions. All right, lobbyists, now that you've heard what we were able to come up with, do you have anything to add? Uh, I noticed that uh, Deanna and others uh, have re are really interested in the Coyote and Crow concept, even to the point of, you know, they would buy fiction in that world. The concept <laughs> of the universe that they have designed seems so interesting on its own. Um, Ryan is mentioning Wilderness War or Navajo Wars. Yeah, GMT Games, you're looking at non- uh, non-native designers, both uh, of them. And Jeff is asking, no dog-eat-dog dog on the list. 
Uh, from what I understand, dog eat dog is not. Also, it's about colonialism and its consequences, but I do not think. Maybe it belongs in the honorable mentions. I'm trying to see if I can find more info on that one right now. It did not come up on the, my research, but maybe it's one we can eat, add to the list. Uh, we are looking quick. Uh, Jeff is really interested in finding out why the people behind Coyote and Crow decided to use fists full of D12s for their <laughs> I game. I don't know. Uh, which is definitely a, 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 a you know an experienced RPG type uh, mechanic. Um, All right, so the designers of Dog Eat Dog are Hawaiian, which I don't know if they're Hawaiian indigenous or if they're Hawaiian settlers, right? right. So it is two brothers that made the game, Liam and William Burke. Um, I said, as far as I can tell, they are not actually indi indigenous designers. But it is a, sto a story of natives on a Pacific island. So there's definitely, it has the theme. Like I said, there are, there are plenty of games with the theme, indigenous themes. All right, so Jeff is saying they are indigenous. So thank you for finding that. I unfortunately didn't find that during my research. So yeah, we'll toss that onto the blog version of this post and we'll make sure to toss a link in the show notes. Right. And Ryan's mentioning that the Coyote and Crow project creators did answer the question of D12s somewhere, but uh, not quite sure where. And that 12 is an important number in the setting. Um, oh, there you go. That uh -huh. makes sense. I was, uh, there was uh, some interesting information I, when I was reading up on uh i don't even want to try and pronounce it again uh fighting was it fighting serpents or no it was uh patoli um apparently part of the the board layout was interested was mayan uh number theory basically and mines were, okay. were big into numbers all along that's where we got that whole 2012 confusion back back in the day right right um but yeah that, so the, the number of spaces and things had all sorts of significance. And apparently there was even possibly, and again, this is, you know, looking back through um, researchers' eyes, but uh, possibly some prediction mechanisms that were being used uh, in a religious ceremony using the same board as the game. So doing, doing double duty there. Interesting. Well, that would make sense why I, like, there were reports of people having carved that one in different mm -hmm. places, too. So, yes, the designer of uh, Wilderness War is a CIA national security analyst who wrote board games about history and is in absolutely no way indigenous. <laughs> um, Navajo Wars, I know for sure, is also the same thing. Right. Um, that's I, In Navajo War, there's a follow-up to that, Comanche or something like that. Again, games about indigenous tribes. I don't know enough about them to know if they were handled well or not. I know when, when Daki came out, there was a lot of pushback over the images on the cover not actually matching anything that would semblance to the Wendaki tribe. And then they were asked if they had consulted, and I think what they did is the publishers then went back and did some consulting and republished, but I'm not positive on that. But again, original designers were not indigenous. Right. All right, so the big thing I'm seeing is people want to play these. <laughs> that, that is the main thing I am seeing, plus uh, complaints about our video quality tonight, which I apologize. We have the bo best possible internet we can get in our area, and I don't know what I can do to make it better. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's you. I don't know if it's me. Um, literally, I will not be putting this up on YouTube unless I can sync the audio from Audacity to it. All right. Well, that's, that's terrible to hear. So I think it was a very worthwhile topic. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to try and sync the audio. Yeah. So I, I'm not saying it's not possible, but uh, the give it, it's going to look a little weird and hopefully it'll sound good if it goes up on uh, there because, yeah, it's, there was a lot of uh, drop. Yeah, that's bad. So Deanna says, uh, given the gambling excess, I wonder if someone carved into the beam of a house because they won the house or the land it was on. That's fair. I could see that. And yes, and Deanna totally wants to play these. <laughs> Uh, the, the abstract ones all look solid. Like, the, well, the fact people are still playing them now, and they're from the year 600, one of them, mm -hmm. that's a good indicator, right? <laughs> Sadly, I, I will admit, I have not played a single game on this list except Liar's Dice, which I have to assume has changed a bit. I definitely didn't. My copy didn't come with beans. 
<laughs> All right, I think we are good to move on. Remember, if you've got a game or game night question for us, head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. We're taking a look at the base coins from the Legendary Metal Coins Season 6 Kickstarter. Before we get deeper into this review, we do have to thank Draw Lab for sending us a collector's set of the base coins in this season. Yeah, so Draw Lab Games launched their first Legendary Metal Coins Kickstarter back in March 10th, 2015. Now, that original Kickstarter project was funded in under a day. Now, that was something rare back in 2015. Gaming projects didn't tend to do that well. This was still kind of the early days of gaming Kickstarter. Now, that set contained 11 different coins, and since then, Draw Lab has launched five more seasons of coins, including the current season, Season 6, which is actually live right now on Kickstarter. Every one of these projects has funded and delivered successfully. Due to this, I think Draw Lab's a company you don't have to worry about supporting on Kickstarter. Given the fact that we've held the base set in our hands, mm -hmm. means manufacturing is under control. They don't still have to build the molds or anything. Yeah, these are a finished product that they're selling at this point, as far as I can tell, except maybe the stretch goal ones haven't been made. Now, speaking of stretch goals, what we're looking at tonight are the coins that are included in the currently active Season 6 Kickstarter. And what we were sent is one of each of the non-stretch goal coins, which are broken over nine different sets. And the reason they didn't send the stretch goals is they didn't know if they were going to fund or not, which makes perfect sense. Now, this sixth set features three concepts. The first is something totally new called Forged Coins. These are a new series of coins based on some of their older sets that feature more three-dimensional effects. Now, what I don't know and I didn't do the research to check is if these are actually the same as their old patterns or just based on their older patterns. But the depth of these coins is very pleasing and very tactile. Um, I was really impressed with these sets. A uh, bit of a spoiler for my final thoughts. The next thing they added in Season 6 are, of course, new coins. Every Kickstarter of Legendary Metal Coins is going to introduce some new sets. Um, there are four totally new and unique sets in this season. Now, again, the Ford sets are new, but based on previous designs, these are four completely new designs of coins. What we also have are something else completely new, and these are adventure sets. These are some unique and interesting coins that really aren't coins they're more like tokens to be used during your fantasy games so just took a quick look and they are not exactly the same so these these forged okay. coins are not just uh, a more detailed or more uh, textured duplicate of the original uh the that's dragon, cool yeah so we'll see that now the best way to see each of these coins is to watch our unboxing video where you can mm -hmm. hear most thoughts as he opens up each set one by one and sometimes struggle trying to figure out what some of them are meant to depict yes all right now that i've uh, taken a look at all of these coins and i've had them out and i've been fiddling with them for the last few days and showing them off to my wife and my kids uh what i want to do tonight is share my thoughts on each of these sets now for those of you here live watching or watching this on youtube i will be holding up every coin as i mention it but do realize that some people are going to be consuming this as an audio podcast. So what I'm going to try to do is describe the coins as I hold them up. It's going to be a pretty vague description, not small details, but it give you an idea of what I'm holding up here. Now, again, our unboxing video is probably a better place to look for a look at each coin because... I used a green screen and I was able to do some close-up shots of them um, while I was opening everything. So I think that's probably one of the better ways. Plus, I will be taking pictures of these to put them up on the blog version of the review as well. Also, if it's not yet April 19th, you can check yeah. out high-resolution images on the Kickstarter. Though I will note that these, de these do seem slightly better detailed than the mm. actual coins Mo got in some instances. Now, what I think I'll do here is I'm going to take all the coins first. So we're going to look at all the coins in the set, and then we'll look at the adventure set separately. Now, for the coins, unlike our usual list of stuff, uh, normally we do things in no particular order. You know what? I'm going to do these in order tonight, because what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with my least favorite set, go to my favorite set, that way saving the best for last. So the first set of coins are the pixel art unit. Uh, this was my least favorite set of coins, though I can see other people digging these. 
Uh, I've never really been into the whole pixel art nostalgia thing. Um, I personally think it's for people who didn't have to live through those days of playing bad graphic video games and 8-bit graphics. It's for people who think that looks neat and nifty. Uh, now, all of these coins are perfectly square. Now, square, not cubes. They're, they're still the same width of the other coins in the set. Um, what these do have on them is the copper has a C on one side and then a couple cups, and then on the other side features a dragon and the word copper, all pixelated. Um, everything's pixel-style graphics. Now, slightly larger, we come to the silver, which has a pixelated S on it and some coins. And then on the other side has like a generic fantasy warrior type, says the word silver, and the warrior type is saying the words, Fear not, my lady. Now, the gold has a G on the one side with a couple of gold bars. And on the other side has the lady, I have to assume, a princess, a pixelated princess, saying, help save me, and the word gold. Again, everything all 8-bit jaggy style graphics. Now, while I don't have a use for these, I think they are really cute, and they fit that genre quite well. Mm -hmm. Though I suspect more of a keepsake than as a coin, uh, to use in a game, perhaps. But that sure. was the pixel art unit. Next, we have the planet set. These are oval shaped um, and all almost the same size. Like they are very different. Like the other set are maybe two millimeters difference. This is like one millimeter, half a millimeter difference. Now, the copper features uh, the surface of the moon showing the earth in the distance off the horizon. Um, pretty classic picture everyone remembers from the original moon landings. And on the other side has a space shuttle launch with your standard challenger style shuttle. Uh, this is a nice deep coin that you can really uh, feel the texture on. Next up, the silver, we have a satellite over uh, orbiting over a planet on one side. And then on the other side, we have uh, like three planets in orbit. It's like they kind of took like an orbital picture of the galaxy and zoomed in. You can kind of tell uh, Saturn's here. And this one's rather flat on this side. You can't really feel much of it. Whereas the... Um, satellite side is a little more etched and deeper. Finally, we have the gold set, which is the flattest of all of them. Uh, there's really not a lot of depth to this. On one side uh, is what appears to be like cave drawings of constellations or ancient constellations, and the other side has a galaxy. Uh, these are a bit of a mixed bag to me. Like the copper coin is nice and deep, as I showed there, with nice 3D artwork, whereas the galaxy constellation and planet sides of the other coins are, are nearly flat. Like there's really not a lot of depth there. I have to admit, I had a hard time figuring out what this constellation was the first time I looked at it until I finally uh, noticed the Big Dipper and someone else pointed out in our chat room that there, what was actually showing on it. So that was another great set of beautifully made keepsakes. They suggest yeah. using them in games like Race for the Galaxy, and I just struggle to see that happening. But they are, again, quite pretty. And that was the Planets coin set. Now, to speak about not recognizing what the patterns are on the coins, uh, the Norse set gave me the most difficulty during the unboxing video due to some of the patterns on them. These coins all feature a Norse god on them and uh, some type of tied-in symbol on the other side. We're going to start with the copper. The copper features a Norse god with a horned helm with some um, runic around the outside. And then a stylized Midgard, Midgard Serpent on the other side. I'm guessing this is Loki, but I can't confirm that for sure. Silver is the one that gave me the most difficulty. Though the one side shows a, a Norse hammer, a Thor's hammer. So that obviously means the other side should be Thor himself. But I had a hard time recognizing this one. I think I've got it. See, even here. There we go. <laughs> Hopefully you can see Thor there. So you have a very stylized Thor with like a, a pattern around the outside of it. So that is the silver Norse god coin. Then we get to the Odin on the gold. I'm trying to find the right side up here. So we have the Odin on the gold with a Voknut or Odin's triangle on the other side. Again, with some different patterns on the outside edges. I do think it's worth noting that the uh, Vaknut has been used by hate groups recently, have been co-opted by that, so there may be some concerns with this particular symbol, but it is Odin's triangle on an Odin coin, which I think makes sense to me. 
Now, overall, these are decent. Um, they have a kind of worn, ancient, beat-up look to them that I really like. It fits thematically. But they tried to put so much detail into the actual gods, they make them hard to see. Like, uh, even the Midgard Serpent just kind of looks messy instead of well-detailed. I would love to see a forged version of this set with deeper carvings in it. Yeah, and this was uh, the set that, to me, most suggested the slight difference in detail quality between those Kickstarter images and mm. the actual coin. Though, still a fantastic set for Norse mythology lovers. And that was the Norse Gods coin set. All right, next is the Atlantis set. This one really stuck out to me uh, for featuring really cool designs as well as not featuring perfectly round coins. Now, similar to the Norse set, these kind of look beat up and well used, but more so. These actually look like they were unprofessionally cast, so they're not perfectly round. Now, the first one is the copper, which is round, but has about a three millimeter notch at the top of the coin or bottom of the coin, however you hold it. And that's on a side, uh, and the one side has like a labyrinth on it or a maze. And then on the other, you have a trident, you know, your typical three pronged fork. The silver from the Atlantis set. Um, is really noteworthy because it just has abstract patterning on one side that again isn't properly centered that gives to that whole um, it was unprofessionally minted and then the other side has like a bunch of unreadable script like uh, you're looking at like a I don't know almost a Rosetta Stone kind of look to it now what's really striking about this is there is a giant A cut out of the stone like literally you can see through this coin through the A on the stone or sorry on the coin which I thought was a really neat touch Finally, we have the gold. Um, the gold here is very, it's roughly round. Uh, it's the most non-even edge out of all of the coins in the set. And it features a octopus on one side. And then on the other side, you have a mermaid and a crab. Now, notable of this is similar to the A on the last one. This has a hole cut through it. Now, that sticks to um, traditions of some of the ancient coins of the real world where people would put thread or, or have these on a necklace or on a bracelet to be able to store their coins. So that is the Atlantis set. And I thought they were the most distinct, I think, out of all the sets. Yeah, these have the most old world historical coin feel. You can really believe, looking at these, that they were dig up by, dug up by some archaeologist somewhere. Uh, and that is the Atlantis coin set. All right, next we're going to get into the Forged set. And we're going to start off with the Forged Cultist set. Now, as mentioned earlier, the Forged coins are based on existing patterns, but not exact to them. Uh, as we did find out, Sean was able to see they did change up the pattern. So it's inspired by older sets, but these are unique patterns. And these are just much more three-dimensional in nature. Um, I love this three-dimensionality. I, I love the patterns on these coins. It, like, it's deep enough you can trace them with your fingers. I love just holding on to these and kind of kind of rubbing them like there's just something cathartic about it i actually think these would be great fidget toys uh for or for someone who um benefits from stimming just give them a set of these coins just to kind of hold on to and play with now the copper features uh, an egyptian headdress on a skull with a crown and a bunch of tentacles behind it um, i immediately think nair lathotep and then on the other side you have um, a runic eyeball surrounded by more eyeballs and some concentric symbols, uh, circles with symbols around it. Uh, basically a bunch of runes on there. Then we get to the silver, which uh, there's a kind of beholderish looking thing, which is a mess of eyeballs all held together by a bunch of tentacles. Uh, this is the deepest coin of the set for feel and touch. You can really feel the eyeballs. Then on the other side, you have some kind of stellar gate symbol with an eyeball i'm trying to describe the 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 cthulhu theme stuff here is just probably just going to stretch my own sanity um so you have an eye and some runes and symbols and this gate looking thing on that side and then we get to the final gold coin which features more tentacles and eyes uh, more like a pile of four eyes in the middle with tentacles growing from it and then the other side an abstract kind of curvy symbol with six points inside a couple's concentric rings that also have six points on them um, again, trying to understand them more than that would probably just cause some sand loss. <laughs> Not personally into the theme of this, but the quality is undeniable, and they still keep a hint of that old coin feel from the Atlantis set, mm -hmm. uh, and that was the Forged Cultist set. 
Now, the Forge Dragon set was the first set I opened and immediately set the mood for what I discovered going forward. Like, I opened these and I'm like, oh, these are even nicer than I thought. I just couldn't wait to look at the next set. And actually, I did. I held off until we did an unboxing video and that was hard to do. Again, these are these are featuring nice deep patterns, nice deep cuts. These are a Forge set. So, you've got that really nice uh, texture to them. The Copper features a large forward-facing dragon head. Um, surrounded by a ring with a pattern on it. And then on the other side, you have a more abstract serpent style dragon on, on the back side of it. Then we get to the silver, which features a dragon head in profile this time with some like wispy smoke around it and um, a braided pattern on the outside. And then we get to the other side has an abstract, I would say Celtic Gaelic style dragon with a pattern on the, around the outside of that. And then we get to the final gold coin. And this is actually my favorite of the designs. It's an Ouroboros style dragon where it's eating its own tail. And it's around a dragon egg. Um, very Game of Thrones looking scaly dragon egg. And on the other side you have a very heraldic style dragon surrounded by Celtic knotwork. This is a really impressive set. I really like the look of these ones. Um, very impressed by them. And while not the fanciest ones we're going to talk about, these might be my favorite for their looks. And the copper sure. one in particular really catches my eye. Uh, that is the Forged Dragon set. All right, the Forged Dwarven set. So our final Forged set is, as you can see, a another set that's not actually round. Instead, these are angular and geometric, which I actually think fits dwarves very well. Now, the copper is hexagonal, features an anvil on one side, and a dwarven helmet on the other side, um, as well as some patterns on the background. Um, kind of not work looking, but more angular. It's not curvy, it's very straight. Uh, reminds me of the Not Dice Squared 2 expansion, actually, <laughs> the way those are designed. Then we move on to the silver, which is also hexagonal, but bigger, with a big double-bladed axe, and then um, a, a, a dwarven gateway, like a doorway, you know, I think of uh, the Halls of Durin or something like that. And on the other side, for any Warhammer fans out here, this is obviously a dwarf inspired by the Troll Slayer character class from the Warhammer world with the, the grizzly beard, the bald head, and a huge mohawk uh, in a ring surrounded by runes. And then finally, we get to the Dwarven King, which is a stylized, the gold coin features a stylized uh, Dwarven King with a uh, bejeweled beard and hair and a helmet um, with a pattern behind it. Um, I'm not sure how many sides this is, but it's, it's two sides more than a hexagon, so an heptagon, possibly octagon. Uh, maybe this would be an, yeah, this would be an octagon? No, it's not enough sides for an octagon. Anyway, again, angular sides. Uh, these are my favorite out of all the sets. I really love the look of these Dwarven coins. It makes me want a set of Elven coins just because I feel like if I have Dwarven coins, I need Elven coins. But I really dig these. A great gift for all your Dwarven friends. <laughs> that was the Forged Dwarven set. All right, next we have the two adventure sets, and I'm going to start with the adventure potion sets. Now, there are two of these included in the set, and they have a rather unique potion-like shape, one being a, a round bottom and the other being kind of a half-crescent bottom. And at the bottom of these, it's kind of notched, and in it, they put glossy lacquer in it. And there's a, a red potion and a blue potion. And when I first saw these, I was a little disappointed because... The other sides have no lacquer and they just look unfinished. And it wasn't until I went to the Kickstarter page and I saw them showing like a D&D character sheet and someone flipping it over. I was like, oh, that's supposed to represent the empty potion. The problem is like the divots there for where the lacquer would go. And I just wish they had put clear lacquer on that other side. I think that would have been the next step that really would have kicked these up a notch. Because as it looks, it just to me, the backs look unfinished. I would have liked it more the other way. These seem like a cool way to track potions. Uh, the only problem I have is with the collector set, I just have two. And like what D&D party only ever has two potions. I just, I think you'd need a lot more of these. But they are still really cool tokens they could probably use for other things like inspiration or something else. And that was the adventure potions. All right, finally we get to the final set of... Uh, coins which I'm, I'm holding up air quotes right now uh these are the adventure weapons these are 
the most impressive as far as how they're made and how well crafted they are. Um, each of these features a fantasy weapon of some type in a ring, and they're twice as thick as the rest of the coins. Like I think they to make these, they probably took two coins and somehow pressed them together. Now the outside edge of these coins forms a ring of some type on all three of these sets, and then in the middle is a weapon. And it's kind of like suspended there because all the negative space around the weapon is cut out. So you can totally see through these. It's like the weapon's kind of hanging there in the ring. Now there's a hammer, an axe, and a sword. Now the hammer is two-sided and both sides are identical. Like it looks the same. Now the axe is also two-sided. And something I totally missed when I did the uh, unboxing video is there are words around the outside of the axe. And it says, warriors don't show their heart until the axe reveals it. And this is cool, but on one side that's readable, and on the other it's in reverse letters. Like, it's it's not readable, which is just a weird choice for me. Especially because the sword is the most impressive of the bunch, because it's two-sided, and the two sides are actually different. So on the sword coin, what they did is you have... Um, on the one side, you have the full sword showing, basically. Like, like not the full blade, but you can see the sword. It's in, in the front, and it's overlaid over two rings, one deeper than the other. Well, the other side of it is seeing only the part of the sword you can see through the rings. So it's a distinctly two different sides on this one, which is a really nice effect, but makes me wonder why they didn't do something similar for the axe, at least to flip the words. Now, while I think these are really cool, I don't know what to do with these. Like, these aren't coins. These are some kind of tokens. And I don't know if I'd want to put them on an adventure map. I don't know. Like, I think they'd be great for, like, inspiration. Here, you earned inspiration. But then why does it matter if it's a sword or an axe? Maybe you use it to represent a magic item. Like, oh, you found the, the plus two flame bringer, and here's a token to represent it. Though I don't know why you need it. I, they're neat, but I'm just not sure what I would do with them. So these, to me, are token more than coin. They wouldn't look out of yeah. place on a map uh, as a character marker. So you can have your party represented Fair. by these on a map, uh, or even if you could find a way to make them into a standee for, for moving around. Um, mm. But that was the adventure weapons. Yeah, now note these weren't considered, like they're in Legendary Metal Coins, that's the name of the Kickstarter, but they don't try to sell them as coins. They are, they are adventure tools as that which actually if you go on their website and look at the older ones they have things like spell trackers and they've got the elements for gloomhaven like they don't just make coins so what i just showed off coin by coin is basically what they call the collector pledge level where you're going to get one of each coin now again the sets we looked at tonight don't include any additional unlock stretch goals normally you would buy these coins in 24 coin sets they contain 10 copper eight silver and six gold coins now, it's also worth noting that as part of the current Kickstarter, you can also order any of the previously released metal coins. And I got to say, like, having these now, I kind of want the rest. Like, a, the, the collector in me wants legendary metal coins one through five now because they're shiny. Yeah, th these are... Um... <clears throat> wow, I completely lost. Uh, <laughs> uh, these, they're beautiful, though. With that beauty and fine crafting comes a cost. They're definitely not something you're going to try and buy for all your games. No, totally fair. Now, I got to say, I knew I liked the coins before I agreed to check these out. Like, when, when I, I, I approached um, Draw Lab to, to ask for a review copy of these, and, I, and I'm like, I'm going to like these no matter what, right? And then they showed up, and I'm like, I was actually even more impressed seeing them in person. Like, these are some of the nicest metal coins I've held in my hands. And better than pretty much every metal coin set I have have in my extensive collection of games downstairs. These are nice coins. Yeah. I commented earlier that the detail seen on the Kickstarter isn't quite what we saw in some of those coins. Mm. But that's not really a complaint. It is the most slight of differences. Uh, I would really say it was only an issue noticeably on that Thor coin. Um, they've got yeah. their QC locked down after, you know, five seasons pre previous to this. Yeah, I did admit, like, I, the, during the unboxing, I could not see Thor on that coin. Even with the hint of a hammer on the other side, I'm like, I don't know what this is. Part of it is, like, if you don't hold it at the right angle, you just, you're going to miss it. Yeah. Now, the other thing that did surprise me, um, actually quite a bit, is these are lighter than most of the coins I have in my existing games. Um, most recently, I'd played um, 
Raiders of the North Sea, which has metal coins, and they're like thinner little pieces, and they have more weight than even the gold coins do here. And I was confused enough about this that I actually contacted Draw Lab and I asked, I'm like, what's up? Why are why are these so light? And for one, they noted I'm the first person ever to complain they're light. And I'm like, no, no, I'm not complaining. I'm not trying to say they're too light. I was just surprised that they were lighter than the other coins I have. Well, it ends up what they've done to make every single one of these is their base is zinc. So they make the coin in zinc and then they plate it with various different metals to make the copper, silver, and gold colors. Now, zinc is softer than copper. So while I certainly wouldn't expect many to try and damage these beautiful <laughs> coins, I do wonder how much rough handling they could take from a rowdy RPG group, accidental dropping, getting nudged <laughs> by chairs, or accidentally, God forbid, a chair leg coming down on top of one of them. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I And I don't, no offense, I don't really want to try <laughs> with my particular set to see what damage we can do to them. Uh, maybe that'll be a future live stream. The, the pixel we'll art, how, we, if we, we can put dam- them on a pair of pliers and, 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 bend and see if they bend. Yeah, exactly, right? Like, that's probably what i do with these ones. It might be worth doing. Uh, we might look into doing that future. Now, the original sets that came out from uh, Season 1, and I don't know why they changed. Maybe it was cost. Did send them to you in drawstring bags? So obviously they felt they'd be fine to bounce around in a pouch. So I, I think they, they're expected to survive contact with each other at least. But yeah, someone rolling a chair over it, that's something different. Now, as I, I basically already mentioned, of all these coins, the ones that impressed me the most were these forged sets. Like, I, I really like the depth of these coins. That, that was the first thing that stuck out when I first touched the first dragon set. It was like, oh, wow. Like, those are some of the deepest cut coins I've ever felt. This is great for anyone with vision issues and works well along with the fact that most of these sets are really easy to tell in size by denomination. Well, I wouldn't say really easy. They're easy enough to tell in size by den- denomination um, with the planet set being one exception out of these. Yeah, I, the size difference are often only a couple of millimeters or less. Um, so unless you've got all three of them in your hands, you might not be able to easily identify which one you've got in your hand uh, uh, based mm. on size uh so yeah if you were reaching in a bag with all of them you could probably tell them apart yeah but feeling what you have in front of you unless you did have all types it might be difficult yeah. i agree yeah. that's totally true now as for the designs um i obviously like some more than others which is cool like that that's acceptable that's that's what i expect right the advantage of having so many different sets of coins is there's probably something here for everyone well i'll admit i am not really a fan of the pixel art set but i'm sure there are zelda or minecraft fans out there that will love them and i appreciate the number of options like just in this season six is nine different sets of coins and each of those sets has three different coins in it now, one thing did come up while I was looking at these is that a fan of the show, um, Red Meeple Ryan, who also happens to be a blind meeple, asked if there was anything on the edges of the coins to set them apart. Anything you can feel like denominations on the, the edges or a different texture on each type. And sadly, that is something you are not going to find here. All of the round and rounded coins have perfectly smooth edges. The only ones that don't are like the ancient style coins, the Atlantis set, but that's just... They're bumpy, like they're unfinished, and I don't think that's going to actually help you from being able to tell them apart. Or, for example, here's one of the cultist sets, and you can kind of tell it's not quite round. But I don't think feeling that, you're going to know which coin that is. Now, what I did do with this information from Ryan is I reached out to Draw Lab, my contact who sent me these, and I said, hey, I've got a blind meeple here who is wondering if you've done this on any coins and suggested doing it on future sets, and this is something they will start looking into in the future. Um, They noted it was something that hadn't been brought up before and it's something they hadn't considered, but it is something they should be able to do going forward. So uh, that's something I'm looking forward to seeing in Legendary Metal Coins Season 7. It's good to hear that they're open to that sort of, you know, constructive Mm -hmm. criticism about uh, their product. Yeah, I just hope it actually leads somewhere. (laughs) Now, one of the other things I do think needs to be mentioned, Sean mentioned this, that these are not cheap. They're not, they, they, they are not, uh, they are rather expensive. So a standard set, this is the, the MSRP, the standard set of 24 legendary metal coins will cost you $29.99 US. Now that's more than a buck a coin. 
Now, there are some bulk deals, and there's pledge levels in the current Kickstarter where you can get 10 sets at once that do drop it to cheaper than this. Plus, Draw Lab does offer some non-standard sets where you can get like just 10 silver coins and stuff like that that can vary that cost. But just looking at the generic, I want to buy one set of metal coins. You're looking at 30 bucks. Now, that's not cheap, but I don't think it's actually unreasonable. These are some really nice coins. And let's face it, every one of these coins is a luxury item. No one needs to own metal coins for the games. It's a nice to have. It's a, it's a bonus. It's, it's something you can do to bling out and prove your games. Or to add a sense of immersion. Or to add a role-playing element or a prop to your game. And to be honest, I think this price point is perfectly fine for what they are. So that's $30 for 24 coins. But for many games, that's not enough to replace the coins in the game. So you do need to bear that in mind as well. That, that $30 may not you know that one set may not cover what you need yeah that is a very true point at one point um going to other sets i backed a kickstarter for a game i didn't own just to get the metal coins in it, it was an add-on item to use them for um galaxy trucker and i ended up having to buy four sets to be able to have enough to replace all the cardboard now, I didn't do the look to see do you use every token every game, but I just counted how many pieces of 1s, 5s, and 10s come in my cardboard copy and ordered an exact amount to match that. And i got to admit it wasn't cheap, and I'm pretty sure the same thing would happen here. I don't know how many games would have just enough money, like especially if you're playing like a, a game of D&D where your characters might be carrying around hundreds of gold. You're probably not going to want to represent that with metal coins unless you decide that the coppers are each 100 gold or something like that. Now, overall... I expected to be impressed by these. As I said, I, I, I reached out to them to say I'd love to check these out. And I was duly impressed. Like, these these are very nice. They actually exceeded my expectations. Yes, I prefer some sets over others. But all of the coins are very well made. I, I can't complain about the quality of any of these. The design, I might have not liked some as much as others. But you know what? That's fair. You're probably going to feel the same way. Anyone else that looks at it is going to have their favorite set. Uh, even Sean and I each have our, even Sean, Deanna and I each have our own favorite set. Myself being the Dwarven Forge set, uh, Deanna's being the Atlantis set, and Sean's being the Dra Forge Dragon set. So even between the three of us, we each have our own favorites. These, I, I, I personally love the Forge sets. I really like the, the deep cut of these i don't think it's a cut i'm pretty sure they're mold like it's injected molded or something but the cut of these or the stamp quality the the depth of the forged coins are really impressive i am looking forward to seeing more forged coins from legendary metal coins i also really like the adventure pieces which aren't coins at all i thought they were really neat like i, I like the set i'm not sure exactly what i do want to do with them but the quality of them and the the ingenuity there is really cool if you're shopping for some high quality, unique metal coins for your games, I gotta say, Legendary Metal Coins is the place to look. I don't think you're gonna be disappointed. Get the sets you like, avoid the ones you don't, and I think the price is justified, though as Sean did mention, could get expensive if the game you're trying to upgrade does have a lot of coinage in it. When you've got a chance, be sure to also check out our written review of these coins over at tabletopbellhop.com and be sure to check out Legendary Metal Coins Season 6 on Kickstarter. As of today, Wednesday, the 31st day of March, you've got 13 days left mm -hmm. to back. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop. We look back at the games we played since last episode. All right, uh, I, this is happening far too often lately. Uh, I apologize. It's the time of COVID. There's other stuff going on, and we're booking vaccines, and there's Amazon sales. But uh, this is another week. My my table did not get used for gaming. Uh, here at the Tuzno household, there was no actual physical tabletop gaming, though there is plans to get some in this weekend. So so hopefully we'll, we'll turn that around. Now, the one thing I did get done this past week that I've been talking about for weeks on the show is some unboxing videos. Excuse me. Is some unboxing videos. Actually, five of them. Uh, the first of which is already live that we just talked about, the Legendary Metal Coin Season 6 unboxing. So that you can go check out right now. Just head over to YouTube. It went live on Monday. Uh, in addition, I also opened up the new edition of World's Fair 1893. Magical Kitty Save the Day. Weight Western Trail and Quacks of Quedlinburg. 
And at this point, I've actually punched, got everything ready, and read the rules for World's Fair 1893 and Quack. So what I thought I would do is share some, some super initial thoughts. These are initial thoughts before having actually sat down and played the game. Though that's not quite true with World's Fair because I played the, the previous edition. But these are thoughts just based on opening it up, punching it, and reading the rulebook. So starting with World's Fair 1893, uh, I received this from Renegade Games. And somewhere... There was a, not a miscommunication, it's my fault. Like somewhere I read something wrong or I looked at a, an entry on BoardGameGeek or on Amazon or something and, I, and I, I thought this was supposed to be World's Fair 1893 Deluxe Edition. Like I thought it was going to be like the Deluxe Edition of Gentis or something, something TMG Games is well known for. And not necessarily, no, because even Renegade's done Deluxe Editions of Arboretum and stuff. So it wouldn't be strange if Renegade did put out a Deluxe Edition, but that's not what this is. And I was a little surprised, so... Uh, this is a more socially responsible version of the game that includes a more diverse group of influential people from that time period, which includes some people that would have been banned from the actual World's Fair that happened due to their gender and or skin color. Now, while I think this is a fantastic change, like I am great to see, I, I, like I think it's great that Renegade did this. And I think it's cool that they got an exclusive deal with Amazon. Like, I realize some people are down on Amazon, but it's great for Renegade Games. So this is a huge, the largest employer in the U.S., second largest, I guess, but whatever. Like, big, right? Like, like this, is, this had to be a good deal for Renegade. Like, I don't know how many units they ordered, but this had to be lucrative. And congratulations there, Renegade, on getting that contract. Like, this is the first big hobby game that I know of that's been an Amazon exclusive. And I don't know how long it is, if it's one month, a year, or always. I, I don't know what the deal was. But what I was hoping for was an upgraded game. Like, I, I thought I was going to get this more diverse group of influential people and upgrades. Now, what I do need to do is actually compare my original printing to this new one, uh, because I'm going off my memory. I'll admit, I haven't played my copy in over a year at this point. Uh, it's not a game that gets brought out, because it doesn't work very well two-player. So it's, it's more of a big group game, something I bring out to a local game store, and well, we haven't been able to do that in over a year now. So it's been a little while, but I, I, I need to actually see, physically put the two next to each other and see if there are differences. But it, like it's possible there's some minor improvements, but I didn't notice anything different except for the new cards. Well, bravo for putting a socially better version of the game out. Just because 1893 didn't allow certain members of society to partake doesn't mm -hmm. mean we have to accept that in 2021. All right, next I've got Quacks of Quedlinburg, uh, which people have been telling me, I think for two years at this point, that I have to play this. You need to play Quacks. You're going to love Quacks. you got to try Quacks. And just before lockdown hit, I I was starting to see this game out at local events. I, I like Probably as early as November um, 2019. Um, if I remember, it was played at our Extra Life event. So I've seen it out, and I've seen people playing it. Um, I know Sean... Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, is a big fan of it. We haven't gotten to do that in a long time. A uh, big fan of the game. And I saw him playing it multiple times, and I asked him, is it good? He's like, oh, yeah, it's really good. You're going to like it. And it just, it never worked out, right? At whatever events Quacks was being played at, I was hosting or I was teaching something else or I was involved in a six-hour game at Terraforming Mars or something else. It just never happened. But I just kept thinking, that's ah, fine. I'll play it next week, right? There was always time. Well, literally, I know we we're going to get locked down, and I, there wouldn't be that time. So one of the things I did is while we were locked down, I did ask for a copy of this for my birthday, which my mom was awesome enough to buy. Thanks, mom. So I did get a copy of it. So I do finally own Quacks of Kledenberg. Um, One of the things I noted during the unboxing, which no one can see yet because it's not live yet, but I started flipping the rules. I'm like, wow, these are short. Like they're only like eight pages. Um, I'm not sure if that counts exact. But one thing I realized while trying to read the rules is they may be short, but they are surprisingly dense. There is a lot of text. It's fairly small text. And while there's a lot of examples, there's not a lot of white space. There is a lot more going on in this game than I expected from just just during the unboxing. And I keep telling people, keep saying, it's light but fun. It's, 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 it's surprisingly good. I, I'm like, oh, it's going to be like Reef Light when I first saw that rule book. And I'm like, oh, no, no, this is not Reef Light. Now, I'm not also saying this is no Euro game. I'm not talking about the Arkwright rule book here either. It's, it's short enough. What looks really cool in this game is it looks like there's more going on than I thought. It's heavier than I thought. 
but a lot of that's based on books. So there are different ingredients that go in your pot and partway through the game, more ingredients unlock. Well, all of these ingredients are unlocked by, are represented by books. And what the ingredients do depend on what books are in play. And here's where it really reminds me of Imhotep, Builder of Egypt, because there is a A side to all the cards and they recommend your first game, use the A side. And then the next game, use the, or I can't remember what it's say, it's the one side. And then the next time, use the two side. And then it ends up there's four sides of each book. So there's four different versions of these different ingredients. I, it might be the orange, uh, the pumpkins might only have one side, but whatever. There's a whole bunch of different books that represent the different things. And, like, I know the Imhotep got up to 10, 28 possible combinations. And that was only with... So six times two boards, four times. Now I can't remember how many <laughs> boards are in Imhotep. That's with the expansion. This has way more than that. Like, like there, there's four different types of each thing instead. Oh, this, the amount of replayability in this I found really shocking. Now, again, I haven't played. I, I'm looking forward to it. Um, like, I really thought I was going to sit down and go, four-page rule book, let's go play. And I'm like, oh, no, I got to read this. And not only that, there's a, a four-page spread that explains all the different cards, the different books, too. So there, there's more going on than I than I at least thought during the unboxing. So maybe we'll throw a caption on or something when you get to the point where I'm like, oh, well, this looks pretty simple. Because, <laughs> no, not quite that simple, which is a good thing. Like, I, again, I'm, we're not getting dark rate levels, but we're also not at, you know, reef levels. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one, and I hope it will get onto the Play With Sean pile while I can manage to get down next. Uh, I really don't think I've ever heard anyone complain about this game, though I'm sure if I go into the reviews on BGG, there'll be people bashing it. Well, of course, if someone rates it a 9, someone else has to fix that by rating it a 1. Yeah. It wouldn't be Board Game Geek if you didn't try to fix the score every time you rate a game. Well, Come on, people, just flip and rate it how you think. When you've played it. Yes. <laughs> How about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming weeks? All right. So Deanna and I have planned to take Friday off. Um, we're going to take some time for ourselves. Uh, this is going to involve some craft beer. We picked up some more of that today. Uh, some charcuterie. We are out at the Cheese Bar. Awesome local resource for uh, meats and cheeses. And hopefully some cardboard. Now, most of all, I'm looking forward to trying to convince Deanna to play some Quacks because I think it's going to be light enough, that even on that, a, a beer and pretzels kind of night, it'll be good enough. Um, after that, we'll probably stick to games we already know. Uh, you know, having a couple drinks is not necessarily the best time to learn a new game. Um, so I'm thinking, like, based on the pile of obligation, maybe some plays of Unfair. But I'm also thinking, you know what, it's been a long time since we played some Codenames Duet. So... No matter what, if we get even one game in, I'll be happy. It's It's been far too long. Oh, I bet you Space Base will be in there, too. we got to get some more Space Base in. Well, I've got some more Supers RPGs to read, and that copy of Worldwide Wrestling should be getting out of customs any day now and be on its way. So uh, I'll have that to read. And we were even talking in our Discord today about possibly mm -hmm. doing a sort of uh, review for that where I do a chapter-by-chapter, chapter, and Mo, who's played and DM'd the original version, can comment on the differences from that first version, which I haven't played yet. Right. Yeah, that might work out well, especially because it doesn't look like my copy shipping. What's up, Nathan? Not that I really need it rushed <laughs> or anything. I got plenty to do. Actually, I was sitting here the other day, and I'm like, I need a new role-playing game to read. Uh, someone asked me that. Well, I, tomorrow I am going to be at an appointment where someone has to sit there for half an hour. So it looks like it's going to be an hour-long appointment, and I need something to read, and I'm honestly trying to decide what to read. I'm strongly thinking I might crack open Sentinel Comics because I don't think it's going to be a very interesting... Uh, unboxing because it's just a bunch of pamphlets right. so I might crack that open or I might just go downstairs and like grab something off my shelf I've never read before which could be interesting so there is that and if Worldwide Wrestling shows up tomorrow morning I'm in on that what I do want to do um, like we don't want to have a topic of Nine more games that Sean read, because it'll be too close together. But what I would like to do is, as you finish these, toss them into this um, the Week in Review segment so you can share your thoughts. Because I have to assume that we have at least three people in our Discord that are eagerly awaiting your words on various games. That there's got to be other people out there looking for uh, Sean's views on more superhero RPGs. Sure. So I think we'll try to toss that in there. All right, moving on. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. First off, a big welcome to Kevin Reno, longtime fan, but new Patreon patron. Kator, 
you get your first Mo gets his first vaccine on Sunday, and hopefully there'll be some Gloomhaven happening in 2021. Yeah, I can't tell colors apart. I'm falling apart tonight. <laughs> Timothy Smith, thanks, Timothy. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle, thank you for dropping in. I think you had to leave early because we were going to say your name because you're never here when we're going to say it. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means I've been here way too long and I'm getting punch drunk or something and my shift's coming to the end and someone get that dang portcullis. Though the doors to the lobby are closed and the portcullis is down, you can always find us all across the web and Tabletop Bellhop, one word, you can find our website at tabletopbellhop.com and you can sign up for the newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for weekly updates. As always, links down below. We need to find a way to say tabletop.bellhop.com less than that while still saying we have all these things. We I keep editing it and cutting it out and it's still, it's too much tabletop bellhop. Tabletop bellhop. Hey, repetition, you know tabletop repetition bellhop. works. Yeah, we should say it seven times. Isn't that what it, I, I, I think I remember learning that in marketing in there at one point. Anyway, if you like the content you're providing and you know where to find it, there is another tabletop bellhop I would like you to find and that is patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop one word where you can support our continued efforts and help us to keep creating this show well that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight for the lobbyists thanks for joining us be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show for tabletop bellhop gaming podcast i'm sean and i'm mo thank you and, <laughs> and game, game on, on.